Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. It can happen to you tonight. You're sitting right where you are now, listening to this program, and suddenly... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to this equitable program last week and heard about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative brought me a copy, so naturally I know that this is your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Mercenary Mother. The current crime wave in the United States, a wave which is proceeding at the unprecedented rate of nearly 5,000 major crimes every day, is composed of an infinite variety of illegal actions. Behind every one of these crimes, there is a reason, a reason which might be revenge or passion or just ordinary greed. Whatever the rational explanation might be, the underlying motive in many cases is easily understandable. Not that any crime, however minor, can in any sense be condoned. But there are times in the lives of men when the pressures of society and their own basic weaknesses drive them to break the law or to take that law into their own hands. However, there is one breed of criminal for whom there can be no possible excuse and on whose behalf not a single word can be said, for his crime is vicious and venal. He is the criminal you are about to meet. Tonight's file opens in a shabby corner saloon located in one of the poorer districts of a large Midwestern city. Seated at a table toward the rear is a thin, tired-looking man holding his head in his hands and gazing at the drink in front of him. Another customer approaches the table. <laughs> hello, hello, Peter, my boy. Oh, hello, Count. Well, you, you seem to be engaged in serious thought. Yeah, I am. I'm in a jackpot. Uh, perhaps we can arrive at some solution, Peter. Do you mind if I sit down? No, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, how is your charming wife? Okay, I guess. You guess? Don't tell me there's trouble at all. Lay off, Count. Don't worry, I have no desire to pry into your personal affairs, Peter. You know that. Okay, forget it. It merely seemed to me that I might be of more solace to you than whiskey. 
I got trouble, Count. Oh, Peter, you know me well enough to know that if there's anything I can do... Nobody can help. I have performed some astounding feats in my time, Peter. If you got a red-headed kid? <laughs> well, I, I don't happen to have one on me, but I'm sure there must be one available. Well, that's what I need. Huh? Are you serious? Yeah. Well, uh, what would you do with one if you found it? Well, Marion figured out a new racket. She got a list of rich families who want to adopt a kid. We're acting like the middleman. I see. We did fine with a kid last week, but now we got a customer who wants a redhead. Why? I don't know, but she won't take no other kind. <laughs> Peter, you're a very fortunate young man. Me? Why? Uh, it's purely a coincidence, of course, but uh, I happen to know of a child who is redheaded and who can be purchased quite uh, reasonably. Are you leveling? Most assuredly. I know its mother. When would you like delivery? When can you talk to her? Uh, I'll speak to her this evening, if you like. Okay, go ahead and make a deal. Uh, how much should I offer? Uh, how much do you want for yourself? Uh, my commission should be, oh, uh, let us say a hundred. Well, uh, okay. Splendid. Uh, offer the dame 150. Uh, suppose she wants more than that. Oh, Count, I can't afford to spend more for a baby. I'm not getting this kid for pleasure. Babies are my business. I understand perfectly, Peter. I shall call on you tomorrow at noon. Marion. What? Can I have another cup of coffee? What's the matter with you? I got a terrible hangover. If you didn't get drunk last night, you wouldn't have a hangover. Uh, that's the first thing you said today that I agree with. You were supposed to be working yesterday. Well, I was working. You sent me out to find a red-headed kid, didn't you? I didn't ask you to find him in a saloon. Well, I got the kid. You what? Yeah, I hired the count to get one for us. The count? That old fool. He knew where he could get a red-headed kid for a hundred and a half. I don't believe it. That is. I promised him a hundred for swinging the deal. Why should we have to cut him in? Marion, we're going to get a thousand for the kid. Answer the door! Okay. Good morning, Peter. Hi, Count. Come on in. Good morning, Marion. How'd you make out, Count? Splendidly. I closed the transaction within an hour after you had commissioned me. Where's the kid? Upon uh, 78th Street. When can you get him? Immediately. I could have gotten a little tyke last night if I'd wanted to. Well, why didn't you? Peter said that I could spend as much as $150 for the child. Wasn't that enough? Uh, yes. Well, then why didn't you get the kid and bring him down here? Unfortunately, I didn't happen to have $150. Can you get the kid now if I give you the dough? I shall deliver the child to you within an hour after the money is deposited with me. Okay. Where will I get my purse? Have you seen a kid? No, but Mrs. Price, uh, that's the child's mother, has assured me that he's a splendid physical specimen. Good work, Count. Oh, it was nothing, really. Okay, Count. Here's a hundred and a half. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, hate to bring this matter up, Marion, but... Uh, I... But what? <sighs> I have something coming, you know. He means his hundred. You get that when we get the kid. That's very fair of you. I'll be back in a jiffy with a bouncing baby boy. A short while later in the local FBI field office... Special Agent Jim Taylor is greeting a friend of his, Sergeant Ray Kimberly of the local police. Well, up a chair, eh? Thanks, Jim. Even you busy? Yes, that's what I want to see your agent in charge about. Oh, what have you got? Well, I'm not sure it's an FBI job, but he asked me to check with you in case it turns out to be. Mm -hmm. Kidnapping. Kidnapping? When? Where? Right here in town. 7th Avenue and 78th Street. Well, I know that district. It's full of cheap tenements. Yeah, that's right. Who was kidnapped? A baby named Martha Price. Mrs. Price called us less than an hour ago. Oh. Any motive? Well, it couldn't have been ransom. Most of the families up there can buy, barely buy enough food. Yet the child's only eight and a half months old. He couldn't have walked out by himself. Any alarm been sent out yet? Yes. Ray, what's the story on the family? Well, it seems that Mr. and Mrs. Price were divorced shortly after the baby was born. Mm. The court awarded her the custody of the child. Well, then it's barely possible that Mr. Price did the kidnapping himself. Is he in town? Well, I don't know, Jim. Well, I'll have the office check on that, okay? Okay. Uh, you been to see Mrs. Price yet? No, I thought you and I'd take a run up there together. Fine, let's go. Pete. What 
you want? Who are you talking to? When? On the phone. Oh, that was Joe Green. What did he want? He located some kids, and he thought we might want to buy them. How does he know we're in the market for kids? I saw him last night. Oh, I guess I told him. Why didn't you take an ad in the papers? Oh, lay off, will you? What time is it? It's, uh, 3.20. Why? Your friend, the Count, has been gone over an hour. Well, maybe the kid's old lady wasn't home. I got a hundred and a half invested in this deal. I ain't interested in maybe. Relax. Let him come up with a red-headed kid and I'll relax. Open the door! Okay. Hiya, Count. You got the kid, huh? Yes, yes, I have him. He's apparently wired for sound. Well, come on. Bring him in. Thank you. Hey, look, Marion, he's got the kid. Let me take a look at him. Hey, he ain't got no blankets on him. He must be cold. No, no, he's a hearty little fellow. Hey, wait, we got a baby blanket around here. I'll get it for him. Uh, get something that will make him stop crying. I'll take care of that. Oh. I'll give him some of this medicine we've used before on other kids. That should keep him quiet. It's the blanket. Wait a minute. I'm giving him some medicine. Okay. There. That's it. <laughs> now, look at that. The little creature is calming down. Yeah, I guess he likes her. He's starting to... Why, you chowderhead. You stupid, broken-down has-been. My good lady, are you addressing me? I am. What's the matter, Marion? Look under the baby's cap. Take a look at the kid's hair. It's as black as your mustache. Oh, dear, so it is. I, I had no idea the little fellow's hair was black. I told you, Count. You remember I said we needed a red-headed kid? Well, I thought this little chap's hair would be red. Why? Well, I've seen his mother at the saloon on the west side on frequent occasions, and uh, she has red hair. Oh. I, I assumed the child would have red hair, too. Count, didn't you ever think maybe the old lady dyed her hair? Hardly. Look. You go back to that dame and get us back a hundred and a half. Wait. Before I resort to such a drastic measure, I have a suggestion. What? Assuming that the child's mother did dye her hair, what is there to prevent us from doing the same to the child? Hey, that's a good idea. Great. Brilliant. Look, you stupid idiot. With a kid's hair, you can spot a dye job a mile away. Now take him back. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Jim. Slide in this way. Okay, thanks. All right, I didn't mention anything about that phone call I got up there because I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Price. I figured that. With the office calling me, they located Mr. Price. He's out on the West Coast. Now we can drop him as a suspect. Mm -hmm. I think the story Mrs. Price told us was nothing but lies, Jim. Yeah, I agree with you. I wonder what she's hiding. I don't know, Ray. That uh, neighbor you spoke to, she said she saw a tall, middle-aged man leave with the child? Yeah, that's right. Well, any more specifics on his description? No, she was pretty vague. She did give me a fill-in on Mrs. Price, though. Said she spends most of her time in saloons. Yeah, I'd have guessed that. Well, the lights changed, Jim. Hmm? Oh, yeah. You know, I wish they'd pass a law that no unescorted women could go into a saloon. A law like that would put half the places in this neighborhood out of business. Make our job a lot easier. If we knew what the tall man really looked like, we might find him in one of these saloons. Well, at least we got a picture of the baby. I'll have the office make copies and send them out. Okay, Jim. Then we'll just have to wait for a break, Ray. As soon as we get one, we go back to work. <laughs> What is this? Hey. What do you want? That kid the Count brought down here. Didn't he say his name was Price? That he was from 78th Street? That's right. What about it? He never bought that kid. Huh? He snatched him. What? He was just on the radio. The cops are out looking for the kid and for a tall man one of the neighbors saw leaving with the kid. Well, what are you worried about? The Count's on his way back up there. Don't nail him. That's what I'm afraid of. Marion, I don't get it. First, you wrapped the Count... Now you're worried about him getting nailed. I don't care about him. I care about me. You don't think I trust that old stew bum, do you? All they got to do is take away his bottle for five hours and he'll tell him everything. Answer the phone! Okay. Hello? Yeah, hello, Count. 
Yeah, I know. Marion heard it on the radio. Well, that's fine. But don't worry about it, Count. It's the best news I had all day. So long. Yeah, right. Told you. You had nothing to worry about. That was the Count. Yes. Well, where was he? Well, I don't know, but he wasn't with no cops. And we got no trouble. Why not? He ain't got the kid anymore. He lost them. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Last year on this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society offered members of the audience a special fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. It sounds interesting. Can you still get one? Yes, Fred. A new and enlarged fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers has just been published. I have one here. Well, just what's it all about, anyway? Fred, it answers a question every man who loves his family ought to ask himself. That question is, if I should die, how much money would it take to keep my family well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? You know, that thought has worried me for years. Well, that worry is over now, Fred. With this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Now, just a second, Mr. Keating. What do you mean, critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Okay, I don't need to know any more. Where do I get one of these fact-finding charts, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Mercenary Mother. readily available statistics on the number of decent families in the United States who, for one reason or another, would like to adopt a child and to accept the many responsibilities that go with the raising of that child. Such an adoption is possible today through the offices of many reputable organizations. Organizations which take great care to see that the new parents are fit people financially, physically, and morally. But sometimes that procedure takes a period of many months. Months of waiting and hoping and waiting again. Not every family is willing to go through that period. And so they seek their relief through one of many unmoral baby brokers. And buy their child over the counter. Buy him as if he were a puppy in a window. Buy him in one of the last remnants of wartime life. The baby black market. Tonight's file continues one hour later in the apartment of Pete and Marion Sheridan. Ain't you going to tell me to answer the door? Go ahead! Okay. Hello, Peter? Count, what are you doing here? I just naturally gravitated. May I come in? Yeah, come ahead. It's a count, Marion. What do you want? Just returning to home base. This ain't home base. What happened to the kid? I told Peter on the phone I lost him. Where? In a saloon. Naturally. How could you lose a kid in a saloon? Well, I was standing at the bar when I saw a friend passing by outside. I I left the little tyke by a pretzel bowl. When I returned, he was gone. You mean the kid met a friend, too? Don't be absurd. The cops are looking all over town for you both. Yes, yes, sir, I've heard. That's why I came here. I need your assistance. Since you were the cause of my uh, <clears throat> present troubles, I feel it no more than right that you should uh, finance a trip out of town. What? It might prove awkward for both of you if I were to be arrested. What are you driving at? I need about a thousand dollars. You won't get it here. 
Get out the way you got in. Hey, wait, Marion. I think we ought to give the cat some dough. Where are you going to get it? Well, Joe Cream told me he could get three kids. I'll go get them, and you sell them. Jim, I've got some good news. The Price baby's been found. That's fine. Where? At a place called the Three Star Saloon. Who found him? The cab driver went into the saloon for a beer. Saw the baby in a cardboard box. Have you spoken to the cab driver, Ray? Yes. He says that when the bartender said he didn't know whose baby it was, he suddenly remembered the story of the kidnapping in the papers. I see. How long ago did all this happen? Over an hour ago. One of our squad cars picked up the baby and took it back to Mrs. Price. Had the child been harmed? No, no. One of our doctors examined him. It's all right. Just a little hungry. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Mrs. Price since the baby was returned to her? Yeah, I just came from there. And? She admitted under questioning she thought she knew who took the youngster. Well, who did she think it was? It seems that a man whose name she doesn't know came to her and offered her $150 for her child. A man she doesn't know did that? Well, she says she's seen him around the three-star saloon a couple of times, but she doesn't know his name. At the same place the baby was found? Yeah, that's right. Did you give her any description of this man at all? Yes, but I'm afraid it's too sketchy to do us any good. Now, she turned the man's offer down, as she claims. How does she account for the baby's disappearance? Well, she says that at first she accepted the offer. Then, after thinking it over, she told the man she wasn't going through with the deal. She sounds like a fine mother. Yeah. Look, will you have these prints run through your identity section, Jim? Sure, sure. Where are they from? There was a rattle in the cardboard box with the youngster that Mrs. Price fortunately hadn't touched. I got these prints of it, but we don't have anything in our files that matches. I'll send them down right now, Ray. You get any other leads? Yes, there's a pink blanket in this package here. Pink blanket? Yeah. The baby was wrapped in it when he was returned. It's not his blanket. Okay, I'll have a lab check it for laundry marks and anything else they find. Thanks, Jim. As soon as I get any report back, Ray, I'll call you. Do you mind if I have another drink, Marion? Go ahead. Thank you. Shall I mix one for you? No, thanks. Ah, I do hope Peter is able to do business with his friends. He shouldn't have too much trouble. The kids are for sale. A toast to your attitude, Marion. It's so realistic. You want me to be a sentimental slob and cry like I was their mother? Marion, I'm sure that not even your worst enemy could accuse you of being sentimental. Hello, Peter. How did you make out? I saw the kids. They're real scrawny. How much can we get them for? Including a hundred for Joe. All three kids have cost us four fifty. Yeah, sounds like a rare bargain. Be quiet, will you? I told Joe I'd call him if you wanted the kids. He can pick them up and deliver them. Uh, I think I'll go down and get another bottle of whiskey while we're waiting. No, you don't, Count. I don't want you getting picked up. Pete. Huh? Go in and call Joe. And tell him to get those kids up here as soon as he can. <laughs> message when I came back from dinner. What's up? I have a report from the ident section on that rattle. Oh, good. What does it show? Those prints belong to a woman named Marion Sheridan. Marion Sheridan? Mm-hmm. I don't think I know that name. Well, there's no reason why you should, Ray. I don't think she's ever worked around here before. I see. But we've been looking for her and her husband, Pete Sheridan, for some time now. Oh, what for? A swindling charge down south. I guess Pete Sheridan is the one who made the offer to the infant's mother. No, no, Ray, he's not. I got his picture out of our files and went up to show it to Mrs. Price. She claims that the tall man she told us about doesn't look anything like Sheridan. You think she's telling the truth? Well, I don't know why she should start telling the truth now, but somehow I think she is. The odd thing about all this is that a study of Marion and Peter Sheridan's records show that they never worked with anyone else. It's always been just the two of them. There's nothing at all in either record that would supply a clue on the tall man? Well, nothing that I could find. Oh, how about the blanket, Jim? Any report on that? Yeah, that came in, too. There's no laundry marks of any kind on it. No, that's too bad. And it's such an ordinary type of blanket. I checked, and it's sold in over 150 stores right here in town. That takes care of the blanket, then. Yeah, except for one thing. What's that? Well, the blanket was rather liberally stained. The lab is analyzing the stains now. Well, have you sent out any alarm on the Sheridans yet? No. No, Ray, I'd rather not send one out if we can help it. So far as we know now, they don't have the slightest idea that we're looking for them. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yeah. yeah, just a minute, will you? I want to get a pencil. Okay, go ahead. Potassium citrate. Aspirin. Acacia. And all this syrup of orange? Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. Bye. That was a lab, Ray. Here's a breakdown on the stains around the blanket. 
Take a look. That's quick work, Jim. Well, those fellows in the lab are wonderful. They break open more cases than they get credit for. I think maybe they're giving us the lead we want on this one, too. Let's make some phone calls and find out. <laughs> That's not bad, Count. Two phone calls, two customers, two babies sold. <laughs> Peter, you're a veritable tycoon. Jay, thanks. Pete. Pete. What do you want? The cops found the price kid and returned it. I just heard it on the radio. Well? I don't like it. Why not? It takes the heat off us. It might not. Uh, Marion, uh, now that you've gotten some cash, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea if, if I... If you uh... went under for a while... That'd be a great idea. Exactly what I was about to say. Now, if you'd be kind enough to advance me, let us say... Uh, Save it, uh, Count. You're not getting any dough. Hey, but, Marion, if he gets picked up, it might be trouble. He's right. There is always the chance that the police might make me talk. Don't worry. Hey, Marion. What's with the gun? What are you thinking? Now, now, now Marion, put that thing away. It, it might go off. Uh, it's going to count. Uh, but you, you you can't get away with this. Oh, you... no? Drop that gun, Mr. Sheriff. Huh? You heard what he said. Drop it. Now, walk over to that wall. Go on, all of you. The police, I presume. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Of course, you realize I have nothing to do with these people. I merely stopped by here for a drink. He's I... lying. I think we can let a judge decide that. Now, come on, let's get out of here. The Count, whose real name was George Bedford, together with Peter and Marion Sheridan, were turned over to local authorities for prosecution on charges of obtaining under false pretenses and conspiracy to violate the state kidnapping laws. They were each sentenced to ten years in the state penitentiary. And thus, another evil combination of criminals was broken up by the combined efforts of a local police department and your FBI. Special Agent Taylor was able to find these criminals because the pink baby blanket had a number of stains on it. Stains which the FBI laboratory analyzed and found to be a prescribed baby remedy. All drugstores in the neighborhood where the baby was found were checked. And the records of one revealed that such a prescription had been filled for Mrs. Sheridan. And so... With such a slender lead as the stains on a baby's blanket, your FBI was able to close another case and to close it with one word written across the file. The word, convicted. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one more point about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Believe me, Mr. Keating, that chart is just what the doctor ordered for a man like me. From now on, I'm through guessing. I'll know what my wife and kids will need, and once I really know, I'll do something about it. So just let me get my hand on one of these charts. Well, Fred, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case revealing the operations of a transatlantic criminal. Its subject, crime on the high seas. It's titled, The Round Trip Murder. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The round-trip murder on this 
is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society have been busy ringing people on the phone telling their friends about the important announcement that is coming on this program tonight. Earl Sweeney speaking. How are you tonight, Earl? Why, hello, I'm fine. Well, Earl, I just called up to tell you that the Equitable Society has some good news in the middle commercial of This Is Your FBI. Equitable has just put out a new and enlarged edition of their famous fact-finding charts for fathers and mothers. If you listen to that middle commercial you'll find out how to get a copy of the new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Round Trip Murder. To the decent, law-abiding citizen, all criminals fall into the same category, a contemptible, greed-infested mob of corrupt, immoral thieves about whom the police should do something. But to the criminal, other criminals are divided into sharp and distinct classes. For some, he has only the loathing disdain that everyone else feels. They are the dregs of that distorted social order people used to call the underworld. For others, he has some regard because they make their illicit living in the same manner he does, and he watches them to see whether there is anything he can learn about the business of crime. His regard for them ends when they are apprehended by the police, for that to him indicates that they were clumsy, and he cannot forgive clumsiness. But there is one criminal to whom all others look with respect, even after he is caught and convicted, because he is the white-collar worker among the criminals. His is the crime they aspire to commit. He is the swindler. Next file opens in the first-class cabin of an American transatlantic liner. The cabin is occupied by a tall, mustached gentleman who is obviously enjoying the luxury of the trip when there is a knock at the door. Come in. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Spencer. Shall I mix your drink, sir? Yes, please. They went on the soda. Okay. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, I packed your bags this afternoon, sir. So I noticed. Thank you, Spencer. Will there be anything else? Not right now. It's been a fine trip, hasn't it? Yes. I guess you're anxious to get home again, eh, Mr. Lemoyne? What? Oh, 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 yes. Very anxious. That's what I always say. You never know how much you miss the good old USA until you take a trip like this. Now, that's true. I uh, packed your bags before any of the others. Thank you, Spencer. I did it for a special reason. Oh? What was that? I was looking for something. What? I was looking for your passport. Well, I admire your frankness. And I admire your courage. What are you talking about? I found the passport. It told me what I wanted to know. What is this? Your passport is in the name of George Lemoyne. That's right. A man named George Lemoyne was a passenger on this ship about two months ago. I was his steward. 
And this is his passport, not yours. Look, I've heard enough of this. I'm only beginning. Get out of here. And go to the captain? He'd be real interested in this, you know. Shall I see him? What do you want? Money. How much? Enough to make me forget. Name a figure. Well, suppose you tell me what your angle is, and I'll know how much to ask. Angle is my business. How about a thousand? Pounds or dollars? Dollars. Not enough. That's as far as I can go. Make it five. I haven't got five. Split the difference. Only five hundred. That's right. Yeah, get me my traveler's checks. Where are they? You know where they are. You can throw my luggage. Oh, yeah. They were in this bag. And that's where they're going to stay. The next morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Haskell approaches. Oh, hello, Dick. Hello, Jim. When did you get back in town? Last night, huh? I just handed in my report, and the boss asked me to check with you. What's this one about? Well, we got an inquiry from Scotland Yard in the mail. What kind of a crime? A man was murdered in London. They couldn't find any identification in his room or in his bag, sir. Uh-huh. But they found an American flag tattooed on his left arm and the letters USN tattooed underneath the flag. Sounds like a Navy man. Yes, he was. I had the prints checked in the service files and turned out to be a veteran named George Lemoyne. Have you notified Scotland Yard yet? Yes, the boss cabled them as soon as I didn't give us the report. What's the case, then? We got another cable back from them telling us that some other prints were found in Lemoyne's room. Do they know whose prints they are? No, they checked through their files and they didn't have them, so they're sending them along to us, airmail. Well, they should be in tomorrow morning, then. Mm-hmm, that's right. Who was George Lemoyne, Jim? Well, as far as I can gather, Dick, he was a legitimate businessman. Well, he couldn't have been very old if he was a veteran. No, no, he was 36. He'd done a four-year hitch in the Navy, had a very good war record. What was he doing in England? Apparently, he went over there on business. What kind of business was he in? Men's clothes. From what I can gather, he went to England to make a deal for some British woolens. I see. He'd been stationed there during the war for a while, and I imagine he'd made himself some friends. Any obvious motive for his murder? None that we can find over here, or that Scotland Yard can find over there. Well, he wouldn't be carrying any large amount of cash on a business trip. No, he'd arranged for credit with a bank over here for his purchases. You think there's anything we can do until we get those other prints in the mail? I don't know, Dick. But let's go out and see if there's anything else we can find out about Lemoyne. Nobody gets murdered without a motive. If we can find that, maybe it can help find the killer. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Danny. Charlie. Charlie Norwood. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll be. <laughs> what are you doing here? Came to see you. I, I mean, what are you doing in this country? When'd you get back? I just got off the boat this morning. No, but I thought I, I heard you want to jog in Paris for a real long stretch. I was. But there are ways of getting out of those places, Danny. Oh, sure, sure. Well. You look like you've been doing fine. I've been breaking even. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, why'd you come back, Johnny? I want to see somebody. Who? Oh. Eloise. Oh, oh. Uh, have you seen her? No, I can't find her. Have you seen her, then? No, Johnny, no. I haven't laid eyes on her since she went away. She's got all my dough. She was supposed to send it to me. Are you sure you ain't seen her? Oh, Charlie. Would I lie to you? I didn't say you were lying. I'll try someplace else. Come on, Danny. Well, Jim, I went over to that address we had on George Lemoyne. Oh, did you find anything? No. It's an apartment house, and apparently Lemoyne took only those clothes he'd need on the trip. Mm-hmm. Dick, was he married? No, he lived alone. Oh, I got a call while you were out. I had to go over to Pier 38. On this case? Mm-hmm. Seems that there was a steward on the ship that came in from England this morning who had been assaulted and left in a closet in one of the cabins. Whose cabin was it? 
According to the passenger list, it was George Lemoyne. What? I guess whoever murdered Lemoyne stole his passport and then booked passage immediately. Did you get any description of the man who called himself Lemoyne? Yes, but it wasn't too good. When was the steward attacked? Night before the ship landed. That uh, makes it a crime on the high seas. That's right, Dick. It's our jurisdiction. Were there, um, were there any prints in the cabin? Yes, there were a couple on a highball glass. And, well, then there were some others scattered around the cabin. No ident on them? Not yet. I sent them through as soon as I got back. How about those prints that Scotland Yard was airmailing? They come in? Yes, I sent them along at the same time. Did you uh, get to talk to the steward? Mm-hmm. He had just come to when I got to the boat. What was his story? Well, he said that he delivered a highball to Mr. Lemoyne's cabin and that Lemoyne hit him on the head. He doesn't remember anything after that. Who is the steward? What's his name? Alvin Spencer. Oh, I've checked. He has no criminal record. But why would the murderer, and I assume that's who was using the passport, want to knock out the steward? Well, it's barely possible that Spencer found out that he wasn't Lemoyne. That's true. Spencer says, incidentally, that he had no conversation with the passenger at all. Well, that's a little hard to believe, Jim. Yeah. You know, Dick, I think maybe we'd better keep an eye on Spencer. Sounds like a good idea. Meantime, we'll just wait for that report from my dent. It should tell us who Mr. Lemoyne's killer was. <laughs> Honey. I got some bad news. Why, oh, what's the matter? Charlie just left here. Charlie? Charlie Norwood? What other Charlie would be bad news? But he's supposed to be in Paris. Yeah, right? he's right here. It's boat dock this morning. But I thought he was in jail over there. Yeah, he must have busted out. Oh. You think he knows anything? I'm not sure. He didn't say anything. He just asked me where you were. What did you tell him? I told him I didn't know. Look, are you all packed? No, I... I sent for my bags about ten minutes ago, but I didn't think we were going to go away until tonight. That was when we were gone for a weekend. This time we'd better go for good. Where will we go? I don't know, but any place will do. Any place but here. Whatever you say. Okay. Get your stuff packed. I'll pick you up in about an hour. I'll come up when oh, I... Oh, hold it a second, honey. Uh, just a minute. The boy's at the door in the other room with my bags. I I'll see you in an hour. Okay. Bye, baby. Goodbye. Come in, it's open. Is that the boy with the bag? Uh -huh. Oh, oh, well, thanks. Uh, just put them down. All right. uh, and is it is it still raining out? Yep. Mm. Think I'll be able to get a cab? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll need one in about an hour. Where are you going? Charlie. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Earl, you're a regular listener to this program. You've heard me mention the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, yes. Uh, just last week I was telling my wife we ought to get one of those fact-finding charts for fathers and mothers and see what it's all about. Well, Earl, it's made to order for a man in your situation. Like millions of other fathers, you've probably worried over the thought of what would happen to your wife and children if you should die. What income would they need to keep well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Where's that income coming from? Mr. Keating, as many a night I've lain awake thinking just that. Well, after you get this Equitable Society chart, you can forget those worries. In five minutes flat, this fact-finding chart shows you how much money your family would need. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. What years are they, Miss Keating? The critical years are the ones before your youngest child finishes high school, years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Yes, yes I get you. Uh, where can I buy one of these fact-finding charts? Well, you don't buy it. It's free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> now 
now back to the FBI file, The Round Trip Murder. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI amply illustrates one important fact about the behavior of criminals, and that is that they are prepared, once they have committed their first crime, to stop at nothing in their effort to live the easy life. The accompanying fact that they must be stopped before it is too late is obvious to anyone who has made a study of the figures on our current crime wave. A large western city in a period of one week this month, January 1948, saw 976 crimes committed. Crimes which ranged from auto theft to kidnapping and murder. It is not impossible to stop the crime wave. One Midwestern city, for instance, imprisoned more people in the past year than it had in any of the past 20 years. But that is only a start in the war on crime. A war which cannot be fought exclusively by your local police or by your FBI. This is a war in which you are involved because you are the criminal's victim. And the only way in which it will be won is with your incessant, painstaking cooperation. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Oh, thanks, Dick. I think these are just what we've been waiting for. Let's hope so. Let's see. Yeah, here, Dick, take a look at this. What? The prints I found on the cabin on the boat and the prints that Scotland Yard sent us match up. Whose are they? Charles Norwood. I remember him. Yeah, they sent his record along with the prints, too. He's received quite a lot of publicity in the course of his career. He should have. Here, look at the jobs he's done. Let's see. He's just about the cleverest swindler in the business. Hmm, 40,000, 60,000. He certainly doesn't swindle anyone for peanuts. No. But somehow I thought he was still in jail. Yeah, so did I. But according to this record, he was released several months ago. And he immediately went to Europe. Oh? There's a notice here from the French police. He was picked up on a swindling charge in Paris, sentenced to a long prison term there. He must have gotten out of that somehow. Mm -hmm. Then he went to London and killed Lemoyne. That seems to be it. Dick, we've got a picture of Norwood in our files. It's on a wanted notice that we sent out on him. I remember it. Why don't you get it and go down and see the steward? Find out if he recognizes Norwood as the man who slugged him. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to send out some feelers and see if I can locate anybody else who's seen Norwood. I'll meet you back here at the office in an hour. Surprised to see me, Eloise? Oh, gee. Yes, Charlie. You figured I'd stay overseas, huh? Well, I... I didn't know. When did you get back? Early this morning. I've been looking for you ever since. I went to three different places. You left no forwarding address. Well, you found me now. That's all that matters. Come here, honey. Well? Let me hold you. Oh, you don't know how much I've missed you. How much I've missed holding you like this. I saw Danny this afternoon. Danny who? Danny Phillips. Huh? Where'd you run into him? At the place where he's always lived. I went there to get your address. Huh? Huh. I haven't seen Danny in months. Quit lying. <laughs> got the whole rundown on you two. You've been going around with him ever since I left. That's not true. I saw your picture in his room. I don't know where he got it, Charlie. You gave it to him. I saw the autograph. But you don't know. I know plenty. In fact, I know that Danny Boy's on his way over here right now to meet you. Who told you that? I was outside your door when he called you. He never called me. Stop lying, I said. <laughs> I know he called you. And I'm going to wait right here for him to show up. What's the matter, Dick? You look kind of done. I am, Jim. I can't make any theory stand up in this case. Why? What's wrong now? I just came back from seeing the steward, and he positively identified the picture of Norwood as being the man who slugged him. Well, at least we know that much for certain now. Yes, but I also checked on the steward, and he's in the clear. 
If he's hiding anything, he's hiding it very well. well. I think our job in this case is clear enough, though, Dick. All we've got to do is find a girl named Eloise. How does she fit in? Well, I've been doing some work myself while you were checking on the steward. Who is Eloise? Norwood's old girlfriend. Her name at one time was Eloise Williams. What do you mean, at one time? Well, I found the cab driver Norwood used when he left the pier after the boat landed. Where did he take him? Two, three different rooming houses. Oh, it isn't the kind of stop at a rooming house, is he, Jim? No. No, he was looking for this Eloise. She used a different last name at each place. But he had a picture of her, and the landlady at each of the three places said that she had lived there, but had moved. What happened to the third place? Why did he stop there? He came to a dead end. The third landlady had no forwarding address. She's probably using still another last name now. Yeah, I would assume so. You know, I'm afraid it's going to be difficult to find her. Have you sent out any alarms? Yes, I asked the local police to check rooming houses and hotels. But I'm afraid we won't have time enough for them to check all of them. Why? Dick Norwood committed that murder because he wanted to get back here for something. And I don't think he's going to wait too long to get what he came for. Where did the cab driver take him after the third rooming house, Jim? To, uh... Let's see, where is it? Oh, here it is. To 73rd Street and 2nd Avenue. He says he drove away without seeing which building he entered. Well, there are a lot of apartment houses around there. I know, but I found one on 73rd Street that might do us some good. Which one is that? Well, according to his record, the last time Norwood was arrested, the arrest was made at the apartment of a friend of his named Danny Phillips. I called the superintendent of the building, but he was out. He'll be back in about 15 minutes. Well, why don't we run up there and talk to him? Fine. But first, let's pick up a search warrant for Phillips' apartment. <laughs> That must be your friend, Danny. Well, go let him in. Charlie, you're not going to... Let him in, I said. Very well. Hello, honey. Come in, Danny. I got here as soon as I... Hi, Danny. Charlie, we've been waiting for you. You... You you found her, huh? Stop the routines. I know the score. Look, Charlie, I can explain. You don't have to. You're welcome to her. I don't want any part of her. You mean you're not sore? I just came here for one thing. Eloise, I gave you 45 Gs when I left. Where is it? I haven't got it. Don't give me that. I spent it, Charlie. I didn't think you'd come back, so I spent it. You didn't spend 45 Gs. Not living in cheap rooming houses. Yes, I did, Charlie. Honest. Danny, if I were you, I'd advise her to tell the truth. It would come out a lot better for both of you. Well, Charlie, she... I got a gun here, kid. Wouldn't bother me a bit to use it. Eloise, you better level with it. How much you got left? About 25000 Where is it? In the hotel safe downstairs. Well, call and have him send it up. All of it? Do like he says, honey. Danny, we won't have any money to get married on. Just get that dough up here. <laughs> Danny Phillips lives in apartment 417, Dick. It should be down this way. Did you get the key from the superintendent, Jim? Mm. By the way, I learned just before we left the office that the loot on Norwood's last job never turned up. What? Obviously, that's what he came back to this country for. Yes, must be. Oh, here we are. Does it? Come on, Dick. Right. We just had this one room. Let's take a look around, huh? Mm. Uh, did you say that the superintendent definitely identified Norwood's picture? Yes, he was standing in front of the building this morning when Norwood came in. Anything on the desk, Dick? Mm, just some unpaid bills. You know, it's too bad to have a self-service elevator in the building, here. Eh? Why? I'd like to know how long Norwood stayed here. It would also be a help to know where Danny Phillips is now. Yeah. Yeah, he could give it. Hey, wait a minute. What is it, Jim? Come here, Dick. Look at this. What? It's a photograph of a girl. It's signed to Danny with all my love. Eloise. That's the name of the girl that Norwood was looking That's for. That's it. But it's autographed to Danny Phillips, and very affectionately, too. Dick, this is beginning to piece itself together. Come on, we got some work to do. <laughs> it 
taken this hotel for somebody to come up here with a package. How do I know? You heard her make the call, Charlie. What more do you want? I want that dough. They said they were going to send it up. Oh, that must be someone with the money. Oh, wait a minute. Well? I'm putting this gun away. Remember, it's right here in my pocket. Now open the door. Miss West? Yes? They asked me at the desk to bring this package up here. Come in. Thank you. Let me have that package. I was told to deliver it to Miss West. Uh, something else for you, Norwood. She's got a gun. Who is this guy? I never saw him before in my life. She's telling the truth, Norwood. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? What? I came here to bring you all back to our office. Now, come on. I think we have a good many things to talk over. <laughs> Charles Norwood was extradited to England to be tried for murder. His erstwhile confederate, Danny Phillips, and the woman called Eloise, received a sentence of five years each in federal prison for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. And so, by tireless, sometimes apparently fruitless investigation, your FBI was able to apprehend a dangerous criminal who was wanted by the police of two continents. The clue which led the two special agents to the apartment hotel where Miss Williams was residing was a photograph of her which they found while searching Danny Phillips' apartment. Because her dress was cut to conform to the current new look, your FBI knew that it was a recent photograph and a check at the photographer's gave them Miss Williams' current name and address. Tonight's file is another example of the swift execution of detail that has won for the Federal Bureau of Investigation the enviable international reputation it now holds. A reputation as an arm of justice which is intolerant of only one thing, the freedom of criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, Earl, I understand you have one more question about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, yes, Mr. Kading, it's this. If I ask my Equitable Society representative for a copy of this chart, does that obligate me in any way? Absolutely not, Earl. This chart was originally planned as a special service for members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Then it was extended to the audience of this program. It's free, regardless of whether you belong to the Equitable Society or not. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to supply you with a chart. What you do after that is strictly your own business. So make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation a factual account of a criminal who sought escape by means of altering his appearance. Its subject, flight to avoid prosecution. Its title, The Plastic Profile. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Plastic Profile on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, hundreds of people all over the country receive phone calls from their Equitable Society representatives. Phone calls like this one. Hello, Jack. This is your equitable representative. Oh, hello. What's new? Well, Jack, I thought you and your wife might be interested in getting a copy of a new chart just published by the Equitable Society. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Why, it might be. What's it all about? Well, tonight on This Is Your FBI, you'll hear exactly what the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers is all about. So be sure to listen to the middle commercial. Yes? In about 15 minutes, Dad and Mother... It will pay you to hear all the facts about the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Plastic Profile. Eight years ago, in 1940, the number of crimes committed in this country was far below the number now being committed by America's huge army of criminals. With the larger number of crimes has come a greater number of convictions, a greater number of people being sent to prison. And yet, back in 1940, when the last United States census was taken, the number of our fellow citizens who gave their residence as prison was appallingly large. More than 317,000. If that number does not sufficiently impress you, then perhaps you should consider that in these 48 states, with a population of more than 130 million, there were only 25 cities housing more people than are currently held in our prisons. Tonight's file opens in a cell in a small prison located in the town in one of our northwestern states. It is early morning, and through the bars can be seen a heavy snowstorm. There are two men in the cell, and one of them is just waking up. Hello there. Mm. Well, when did you come in? Last night? Must have been after I went to sleep. It was. Hey, don't I know you from someplace? I don't believe so. You live around here? No, no, just passing through. Somehow I know I've seen you kiss her before. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Now I know. There's a picture of you on a circular in the post office. I seen it last week. Huh. Funny I should remember. Just seeing it once like that. Everybody does, especially the police. That's why I'm here. My name's Joe Crawford. Hello, Joe. I'm Slim Baldwin. What are you in for? They're holding me for the FBI. Wow, that's bad. What's that? Quiet. Give me that stick. Yeah. Who are you talking to? A friend of mine. Ox Putman. He sends very well. You can understand this? Of course. He just asked us at a time for busting out of here. That's right. Would uh, Mr. Ox Putnam object to company? Not if the company kept his mouth shut. <laughs> One of my specialties. Okay. Then we all go tonight. <laughs> Next morning at the local railroad station, Special Agent Jim Taylor is met by Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Hello. Hello, Jim. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Okay, guy. Well, looks like you've had some typical weather. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the weatherman says it really hasn't stopped snowing yet. He thinks it'll start again in about an hour. Well, I'll be gone by then, I hope. Well, I don't think so, Jim. I got some bad news. Why, what's wrong, Jim? Well, the man you came up to get broke out of jail last night. What? They broke out with two others. One of them was caught here at the railroad station. The other, a man named Joe Crawford, still missing. Then he and Baldwin might be together, huh? Yeah, maybe. Let's get going, huh? Okay. 
Jeff, how'd they get out? Uh, Crawford told the guard he wanted to see the warden. Mm. When the guard opened the door, Crawford grabbed his arm, knocked him down, took his keys. Once they got those, they were as good as out. Now, I think I know what you mean. I remember that cracker box jail you have here. Hey, I thought they were going to build you a new jailhouse. Well, there was a referendum at the last election. People voted against it. Doesn't make much sense to have a good police force and a bad jail. <laughs> That's what we tried to tell everybody. Now, here we are, Jim. This is the car. Thank you. Let's head back to the office and see if there's been any word. Is the hideout very far now? No, no. It's that cabin down at the end of the road. See the smoke coming out of the chimney? Huh, someone there? Yeah, Aunt Mary. Your aunt? No, no, she runs the hideaway. Oh. You can hold up there as long as you want. Well, I won't be staying long. I've got to get back to Seattle. Got a dame there? No. Got some money stashed there. Well, you better not make your move too soon. They'll be throwing plenty of pictures of you around. You know how that kisser of yours stays with people. No, that's true. Hey. What is it? Yeah, I got a great idea for you, Slim. Why don't you get a new face? Well, I've considered that, but I never had the time. Well, you'll have the time now. And Aunt Mary knows a guy who does the best plastic work in the whole state. A legitimate doctor? Well, he was once. He knows all the angles. Why don't you give him a try, huh? Uh, I'll think it over. Okay. Well, here we are. Is this Aunt Mary's? Yeah. Oh, boy. <sighs> You'll have to plow through the snow a little. That's all right. Can you make it okay? Sure, sure. You suppose she's home? Oh, sure, sure. She's always home. Hello, Aunt Mary. You, Crawford. <laughs> That's Come right. Come in. Come in, Joe. Yeah, go ahead, Slim. That a boy. Oh, it's got a fire in here. Yeah, ooh, feels good. Aunt Mary, this is Slim Baldwin. Well, how do you do, Slim? Hello, Aunt Mary. We, uh, we just busted out of jail. You did? Yeah. Well, bless you both. Let me fix you a nice hot meal. Busy, Aunt Mary? Oh, no, come in, Joe. I thought you went in to take a nap. Oh, I'm not tired. Oh, where's your friend, Slim? Oh, he's sleeping. He was knocked out. Oh, poor boy. Is he an old friend, Joe? Nah, nah. I never seen him till yesterday. He was being held for the FBI. They had circulars on him all over town. Well, my, I'm flattered to have a celebrity in the house. He's too much celebrity. That's his trouble. What do you mean? Everybody knows his kisser. That's why he got picked up. Oh, what a shame. Say, Aunt Mary, is that plastic doc that you used to know still around? No, you mean Doc Smith? Yeah, that's the guy. No, he died a few months ago. Oh, that's too bad. I had a chance for us to make a real good commission. How's that? Well, I talked to Slim on the way out about having his kisser fixed. And a few minutes ago, I started on him again. Yes? He finally decided to have it done. I said you could get Doc Smith for the job. I, uh, said it would cost him five Gs. What did he say to that? <laughs> he said he'd pay it. He did? Yeah, yeah, he's got some dough stashed up in Seattle. Well, Joseph, we, we can't let money like that slip through our fingers. Well, what can you do? I know another doctor. Huh? I'll have him here tonight. <laughs> Jeff, how did you get Baldwin? Oh, we just recognized him from the wanted circular and picked him up. What was his specialty, anyway? Jim with that? A lot of women thought he was attractive. That's the way he earned his money. Oh, I see. On his last job, he picked up a woman on a train. She was a maid. He talked her into lifting her boss's jewelry. On a train? That's right. <laughs> hey, who is this uh, Joe Crawford that he escaped with? Well, he's wanted for murder. He uh, shot a cashier in a local factory. Got about 30000 in cash, but... Fortunately, he had it all on him when he was arrested. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Robert speaking. Yes? Yeah. They did? Well, when? Oh, I see. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, what was that number again? Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, I got it. Thanks a lot. 
We got a break, Jim. That was a farmer named Gordon. Baldwin and Crawford knocked him out and stole his car early this morning. How come he didn't report it until now? Well, he just came to. Oh. Well, let's get a good description on the car and send on an alarm right away. Right. And, Jeff, I think I'll go out and have a talk with Mr. Gordon. Here, uh, here's some more wood for the fire, Aunt Mary. Oh, aren't you the good boy, Joe? <laughs> Say, is uh, Slim still sleeping? No, he's been in here visiting with me. I-, I just sent him back to his room. Get ready for the doctor. Oh, when's he coming? He should be here any minute. Did you, uh, did you talk to Slim about the dough? Yes, I, I told him I arranged everything with the doctor. I told him that he didn't have to pay till he got back to Seattle. Did you tell him that we'd go up with him to collect? Oh, yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> swell. Well, there. How's that for a fire, huh? Oh, that's beautiful. You know, it reminds me of a building my departed husband once set fire to. <laughs> and Mary, you killed me. Well, that's probably the doctor now. Let him in. Well, hello, doctor. Hello, Mary. Well, come in, won't you? Yeah, thank you. Uh. Joe, this is Dr. Montgomery. Oh, uh, Doc, this is Joe Crawford. Hiya, Doc. Fine, fine. Let me have your coat. Uh, sure. There we are. Sure. Goodness, where are your rubbers? Huh? You must have forgot them. This the patient? No, he's in his bedroom. Do you think you can do the job tonight, Doc? Sure, no trouble at all. Got all the instruments in my little black bag. What kind of a face are you going to give the guy? What kind would he like? What kind you got? All kinds. He can look like he ate Southern, Robert Mantel. Oh, how glamorous. Who are them guys? Oh, they're very handsome men. Uh, but, Doctor, why don't you talk to the patient? After all, he's the one who'll have to make the choice. He's in his bedroom, Doctor. You go right in. Very well, very well. Hey, Aunt Mary. Yes, Joseph? Uh, this may not be the right thing to ask, but has the doctor been drinking? Of course. But... How can he operate? Operate? Well, the only time he's used a knife in his life is to put butter on his bread. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Jack? With those youngsters of yours growing as fast as they are, here's something you'll want to see. It's called a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Fact-finding chart? How's that going to help me? It'll help you, Jack, because you're the kind of man who isn't afraid to face facts squarely. For example, what would happen to your wife and children if you should die unexpectedly? Would they be able to make out all right? Would they have enough money to keep well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? When you put it that way, Mr. Keating, I couldn't say... But that fact-finding chart sounds kind of complicated. Not a bit, Jack. It's the simplest thing in the world. With the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart, you'll have your answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you're finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Hold your horses, Mr. Keating. What do you mean, critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. I see what you mean, Mr. Keating. I guess I ought to get this fact-finding chart. How much do they charge for it? (laughs) Jack, it doesn't cost you a single cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with them, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone in tomorrow to bring you an Equitable Fact-Finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Plastic Profile. To 
Tonight's case from the files of your FBI lays bare the primary emotion of every criminal, the desire to get his hands on what belongs to someone else. No matter what the cost in physical pain or mental torture might be to the victim. When we in this nation reach a point where every person in every section is truly a civilized human being, then there will be no more crime waves, nor any criminals. Because the true stamp of civilization is a deep compassion for your fellow human beings. But until we reach that utopian day, it is our bounden duty to cooperate at every turn with our local police, and with every other law enforcement agency to see to it that the war against crime is waged successfully. Tonight's file continues in the small office of Sergeant Roberts of the local police. Jeff, Jeff, can I come in? Oh, come ahead, Jim. Did you get to see Mr. Gordon? Yes. Yes, he had a pretty nasty blow on the head. Well, could he give you anything? Yes, I showed him Baldwin's picture on the wanted circular and that picture of Crawford that you had. Uh-huh. He identified both as the men who stole his car. Well, at least we're sure of that much. Well, if they stay on any main highway, they should be picked up pretty soon, huh? I would think so, Jim. That alarm has been on the local radio station every 15 minutes since this morning. Uh-huh. No problem. Robert speaking. Huh? Yes, Mr. Atkinson. When? You sure? Yes, I see. All right. Thank you very much. That was a Mr. Atkinson, Jim. He just heard the alarm on the radio. And he saw the car? Yeah. When? This afternoon. It went past his house up Nine Mile Hill. Where's that? Oh, about 35 miles from here. Mm -hmm. He also said that he noticed the car because it was the only one that went past his house today. We might be able to follow the tracks then if it doesn't snow again. Yes, we can get out there first thing in the morning. We don't have to go by car, Jim. We've got a helicopter. I'll fly us out there as soon as it gets light. Now, what is it, Jules? Slim ain't dead, is he? What precious no. What makes you think that? Well, I just looked in that room where he is. He, he's out cold. Well, naturally. Oh, is that... Is, is, is he supposed to be that way? Well, the doctor was very generous with the chloroform. Oh. How long will he be out? About another hour. Then can he take off those bandages? No, son. They won't come off for a few weeks yet. What? But I don't want to wait here that long. He won't have to. And travel as soon as he regains consciousness. With his head all bandaged like that? Well, of course. I'll get him a cap with earmuffs, then with his coat collar turned up, no one will notice him. Uh, I hope that car we picked up holds together until we get to Seattle. Oh, we're not using that car. Hmm? Might be hot. Uh, we'll use Doc Montgomery's. What about the doctor's dough? He's already gotten everything he's going to get. You, you paid him? Gave him two bottles of whiskey. That should keep him very happy. Suppose the doctor gets in touch with Slim and asks for his dough. How's he going to do that? Well, I saw Slim write down his address on a pad for the doc. As soon as he has a couple more drinks, get it back from him. <laughs> right. Now, give me a hand here. I'm looking for something. What, Aunt Mary? My best shawl. Got to dress up if we're going to Seattle. <laughs> Jim, we should be over Nine Mile Hill in a couple of minutes now. How low can we fly this thing? Oh, well, fly it as low as we have to. We can land any place. I've never been in one of these before. They're great for up in this country, Jim. Things certainly do look beautiful from up here. <laughs> Looks like a Christmas card. Yeah. Jeff, is that Nine Mile Hill straight ahead there? Yeah, that's it. Be over it in a few seconds now. Atkinson was right. There's only one set of tire tracks going up at... Let's follow the road. Well, there's still only one set of tracks. Well, like it didn't start to snow again. Jeff, look. The tracks are turning off the road. Where? On the left there, the trees. Oh, yes, I see it. There's a car down there, right next to that cabin. Yeah. I'll drop down. Sedan, Jeff. Yeah. Looks like a Buick. Left rear fender's done it. I was in the description. 
I'd say that was the car that was stolen from Mr. Gordon. I'm going to land in that clearing in back of the house. You warm enough, Aunt Mary? Oh, certainly. I love this weather. How about you, Slim? I just hope this face of mine turns out all right. Oh, Slim, it's going to be beautiful. How do you know? Well, the doctor showed me your face before he put the bandages on. Huh? What do I look like? Like a Greek god. Yeah, I was pretty worried about how it would turn out. Why? Well, I smelled whiskey on the doctor's breath just before I took the, the anesthetic. Oh, he just had one little nip. Uh -huh really drunk when we left. Well, he wanted to relax after such a difficult operation. Now be a good boy and stop worrying, Slim. You're going to look fine. Aunt Mary, how long since you've been to Seattle? Oh, heaven, not for years. Oh? Well, this will be like a vacation for you then, huh? Mm -hmm, you should say so. First thing I'm going to do is go to a department store and do some shopping. <laughs> oh, gee, that's just like a dame. Spending all your money on clothes. Money? Gracious, Joe, I didn't say I was going to buy them. Huh? You're much too young to remember, but in my day, I was the best shoplifter west of the Mississippi. <laughs> Jeff, keep your gun drawn. Cover me. I'll throw open the front door. Okay. Here we go. Right I'm up, going in, Jeff. I'm right with you. Right the Someone in the next room. Come on, Jeff. Let's take a look. Right, right, right I have here a little bottle of wonder syrup. It's nectar of the gods. Hello, you... Doc. Huh? Come on, Doc. Get with it. What are you doing here? I know you from someplace. Can't. Place the face. I arrested you for selling snake oil last year, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right, you did. Who is he, Jeff? Wonderful Old medicine that showman. That calls himself a doctor. More or less the town drunk. What would he be doing here? I don't know. Look, let's show him the pictures of Crawford and Grove and see what he can tell us, huh? Good idea. Oh, uh, doctor. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Take a look at these pictures, will you? Fine pictures, fine pictures. Yes, we know they're fine pictures. These men were here. Where are they now? Gone. Gone. Oh, gone. They were very rude. I don't think he's going to Left be much help to us, Jim. Goodbye. We'd better look around the rest of the place and see if we can get a lead. But I know where they went. You do where? Yeah. Come on, Montgomery. Make some sense. They went to Seattle. Fellow gave me his address. You want it? Yes, of course I want it. Uh, it's... Huh? Oh, it's on a little pad. Must be in the other room. Hey, Jim, I noticed that pad on the table in there. Come on. All right. Here it is, Jim. Yeah, but there's nothing on the pad. Mm, Wait a minute, Jeff. There's some indentations. Yeah, but they're not deep enough to read. You got a flashlight? Uh-huh. Turn it on. Hold it parallel to the sheet of paper, will you? Okay. This way? That's it. There. See how that accents the indentations? Yeah. Looks like an address there, Jeff. Uh-huh. I can make it out. 4411 Canal Street, Seattle. You know, the doc could be telling the truth, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I know. I wish I could go with you, but that's across the state line and out of my territory. Well, let's fly back to the airport. I'll catch the first plane to Seattle. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Mary. Let's see now, can I get you anything? Well, if it wouldn't seem too rude, you could get us the money. Money? Yeah, uh, yeah, the five G's for the doc. Oh, of course. I'll get it right now. Gee, you keep that much cash here? This wall safe is pretty well concealed. Mercy, I'd be afraid of thieves. <laughs> I think they extend professional courtesy. Here we are. He's got a gun. That's. Right, Joe. Slim, you, you put that away. You, you'll hurt somebody now. I will if you two don't get out of here. What is this? Pretty apparent, isn't it? I'm saving myself $5,000. Young man, this is most unethical. It's just good business, that's all. Look, Slim, what are we going to tell the doc? Don't give me that. You had no intention of paying. But you got a new kisser. Yeah, you're wrong, Joe. What? Huh? 
He's still got the same face under those bandages. What are you talking about? That man wasn't a doctor. He didn't touch your face. If you're lying, I can, I can feel it. <laughs> what you feel is plain plaster. If you don't believe me, take off the bandages. See for yourself. Go ahead, take them off. I will. Is that the truth, Aunt Mary? Yes, Joe. He'll find out when he looks at himself in that mirror. Wait. You dirty... Get his gun, Joe. Right. Let it go. Oh, no. Now we take over. Good work, Joseph. Now take a look and see what Mr. Baldwin really has in that wall safe. There you are, old Huh? A cop. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Well, you just arrived in time, young man. That fellow there with his face half covered with bandages is a criminal. I want you too, Mrs. Dawson. <laughs> And I'm taking these two to a jail they won't break out of. Slim Baldwin was sentenced to 20 years for theft from an interstate shipment. Joe Crawford was given two years and turned back to the local authorities for prosecution for murder. Mary Dawson received two years and a $1,000 fine, and the bogus doctor's probation was revoked, and he was returned to jail for one year. And thus, once more did cooperation between a local police officer and a special agent of your FBI result in the successful pursuit of a group of criminals. The method of reading indented writing, which led Special Agent Taylor to the address in Seattle, is only one of many skills in scientific crime investigation which form a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes a duly authorized and qualified member of your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. my friend Jack Stone says he has one more question about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. What is it, Jack? You say this chart is free, Mr. Keating, but there must be some strings attached to it. No, Jack, not one. This chart was originally created as a helpful service to members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Now it's being offered to the audience of this program. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to supply you with a chart. What you do after that is strictly your own business. So make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A revealing account of the activities of two teenage lawbreakers. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Eager Ensign. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for The Eager Ensigns on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.